the trouble with fraud. It's like the evil twin of the real economy. It's part of the real economy and you can't necessarily get rid of it. And it might be that the optimal amount of fraud to tolerate might be surprisingly high. Thank you for listening to Investorama, your guide to the future of investing without the hype. Welcome to the Investorama podcast. We're recording this on the 20th of March and a lot has been happening. And I've been wanting to talk to today's guest, Dan Davis, for a while because of his book, Lying for Money, which has become my reference when it comes to financial fraud. And I think it's a very important topic. But it turns out that he's also one of the most sought after commentators on the banking crisis. So I feel particularly privileged to speak to Dan today. Dan, welcome. Great to have you here. Thanks very much for inviting me. So you said on the Oddload podcast, you were an uh, emergency guest, uh, that you're the guy that's invited when things are bad. Can you tell us uh, about that? Yeah. Please? Yeah. And, you know, if, if you're talking to me, then something has usually gone wrong in your portfolio or something's gone wrong in the banking system. I spent my career as a equity analyst uh, with Credit Suisse, Exxon, BNP Paribas Bank's teams. Before that, I was at the Bank of England. And I've always had a bit of a speciality in crises and runs and drama like that. It might have been better for my bonuses if I'd been an expert on bank success, but I'm an expert on bank failure, and that's the trade I was in. And it's kind of related to the stuff I've later written about fraud, because the whole banking system is about confidence and trust. And so it's really interesting, in my view, to think about the conditions in which that confidence breaks down and then the consequences uh, and the ways that people try to build it back up again. All right. So this is kind of the link because I was re reading your bio. Yeah. It says you're a managing director at Frontline Analyst. It's a consultancy. Yeah. You're the author of Life for Money. The author of the Brompton as well, which perhaps we're going to leave uh, outside of this conversation yeah. for now, <laughs> and a columnist in particular in banking crisis. So that's the common thread, this confidence mm. and trust, right? Or the lack yeah. of it. But we're going to start with the banking and then mm. I think we can hopefully link it back to the book because this podcast is not about news, right? It's about slow news, concepts, framework. But when Credit Suisse is being yeah. wiped out, <laughs> We need to talk a little yep. bit about it. The quick news is that, yes, Credit Suisse, major financial institution, is mm -hmm. being bought by UBS, and it's been done on the weekend, right, for mm -hmm. $3 billion, which sounds very much like a penny. And there's also news yep. that $17 billion worth of uh, bonds are mm -hmm. being uh, written down to zero. So could you just have your, your take on that? Yeah, this is kind of surprising. The bonds that have been written down to zero are called AT1, which stands for Additional Tier 1 Capital. They're also occasionally known as COCOs, which mm -hmm. is short for Contingent Convertible. I was actually around at Credit Suisse because Credit Suisse invented these financial instruments in the last crisis. Wow. The purpose of these securities is that they are meant to provide capital for a bank that's gone into resolution. So... If you were buying these things, you were buying them with a high coupon. They were high yielding instruments and that's why they were popular. But everyone getting into these things knew or should have known that if the bank gets into real trouble and they could get zeroed out. What I think has surprised and dismayed people is that these bonds are getting zeroed while the equity is still getting some value. So. Indeed. Three billion of purchase price it equates to somewhere between sixty or seventy Swiss francs on teams per share. I haven't checked the exact price, but it's yeah. it's not a great deal of money compared to what Credit Suisse was worth even a few years ago. But it's not nothing. So it seems that these bonds have become junior to equity. That was always something that was regarded as possible. It was in the legal terms of the bond saying there is no guarantee that uh, you will be senior to equity, but it's always been understood in the markets that these bonds would not be zeroed in a situation where equity got anything. But it turned out that the Swiss government felt that it needed to give equity holders something just in order to get the deal through, uh, but it was able to zero these 
kind of this particular series of bonds, and that's what they've done. Okay, so that's interesting about reading the news because indeed, I when I saw that, and the the headline of the news is that seventy billion dollars of um, bonds gone to zero without uh, you know further t too many details. I was shocked, but now your explanation yeah. makes uh, perfect sense. Yeah, and. If we zoom out a bit from a bit, are we in a banking crisis? I mean, we, there's been quite a few, right, in just yeah. a few weeks. Or is it the bad apples that are falling and we keep going? Well, it feels like a bit of a banking crisis, doesn't it? Because we had Silicon Valley Bank went last week and Signature Bank of New York went in the same weekend as some Silicon Valley Bank. And you could say that those banks basically had similarities. They were both kind of big in tech in that Signature Bank was a big bank for crypto. They were both US. And now this week, Credit Suisse has gone. And it looks like the only connection that Credit Suisse had to Silicon Valley Bank was that it had jumpy depositors. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's really no kind of none of the same treasury management or liquidity management issues at Credit Suisse that we saw at Silicon Valley Bank, but it was losing deposits because it had ultra high net worth clients depositing the money there, and they were getting more and more scared might not be the right word, but they were getting more and more uncomfortable with seeing Credit Suisse constantly in the newspapers for having done something bad or done something dumb. And then when you've got this environment of excessive fear, that tends to spread and it looks like they lost confidence. What seemed to finally do it for Credit Suisse was not so much the ultra high net worth clients and depositors as that other big banks were beginning to refuse to do transactions with them as a counterparty. And when that starts to happen for a big wholesale bank, it's very difficult to come back from that. I haven't so far heard of that element of contagion spreading. Now, if we think back to 2008, there were days in 2008, 2009, when HFSBC and Citigroup were refusing to face each other as counterparties. And that really was a full-on crisis. You've got two of the biggest banks in the world refusing to face each other. Credit Suisse was beginning to get people refusing to take its risk, but I've not yet heard of any single other big bank uh, which is refusing to face any other single big bank. So maybe they've stopped it, maybe they've only temporarily arrested it, but it is, seems clear to me that our problem at the moment is confidence in the overall system, and I guess that's what's the definition of a banking crisis. Right, yeah. No, no bank can survive if... Uh all the depositors run. Uh, what, what is perplexing me still is that um, this seems like an extreme lack of confidence in an institution that's been around for hundreds of years. Yet elsewhere in the market, or at least where I'm looking, you know, very superficially, equity markets, things like that, we don't seem to be nowhere near a major crisis. And it seems perhaps, I don't know if there's a dissonance or if indeed those were the few bad apples and perhaps we move on, right? And I certainly think it's a possible scenario. The thing that really is weird this time around, I think it's exactly what you've identified, is that we've not got any bad assets. Yeah. Silicon Valley Bank looks like it's going to be the best bank ever to go uh, into insolvency. You know, It went bankrupt on US government bonds and agency mortgage bonds. Credit Suisse has been taken over with uh, 17 billion of bondholders wiped out in a situation where no one was even asking any questions about whether its assets were bad. And so it's not like um, you know, the Greek bank crisis or the Euro crisis or even the 2008-2009 um, mortgage crisis where people were genuinely worried about the value of assets and people were generally worried about bad loans. It's just people panic. It's, it's a pure example of a bank panic because people are just panicking because they worry that other people will panic. Yes, fair enough. The podcast, which I restarted recently, uh, has already an interesting history because my first guest was Edward Chancellor, who's a, an author on bubbles. Oh, he's great. A book about uh, interest rates. And uh, 
well, one of the things we discuss in one of the things of his book is that this zero rates environment means people take bad decisions that eventually mm -hmm. have consequences. Uh, and it seems to me like, uh, you know, Silicon Valley Bank, maybe the problem was too much, too much cash. It absolutely was, yeah. Where well, there's too much cash and it's moving too fast. Well, uh, there's tremors. Yeah, and, and I think people might have underestimated how fast things can happen these days um, because you can just get, as we saw in Silicon Valley Bank, suddenly all of the depositor base turn out to be connected. You might have thought you had 4,000 depositors, but in fact, those 4,000 depositors are all of them influenced by a couple of dozen venture capitalists. And those couple of dozen venture capitalists are all members of two or three WhatsApp groups. So whereas you thought you were diversified, in a crisis, suddenly it turns out that you have a, a, a liability side that behaves more as if you have two or three massive depositors. Yes, it did. But, uh, and I saw your article and the, the concept of narrow bank, which is uh, yeah. probably failing. But uh, what about Credit Suisse? So is it the same thing? Eventually all those big banks, they, well, they chat to each other and the same thing happened. Or is it just that after all, if, uh, you know, at the first time of crisis, we should all take off our deposits if we were, and people see news and we, there's a herd without being necessarily connected? Well, I think the other thing to remember about Credit Suisse is that this is an action of the regulators. Mm -hmm. um, Credit Suisse could have opened its doors today and started doing business today. It might not have been in the greatest shape to do so, but it had borrowed... 50 billion Swiss francs, so about 55 billion US dollars from the Swiss National Bank at the end of last week, which would certainly have allowed it to open its doors. And there was decent evidence that it had liquidity to meet deposit withdrawals for quite some while. But what happened is that over the weekend, the SNB, presumably after having talked to its fellow international central banks and to other regulators just made the decision, we aren't going to let this go on anymore. Because one of the things that you have to do as a central banker managing a situation like this, you know that the earlier you act, the less you're going to have to do. If you're worried that a crisis is developing, you go hard and you go early. And in this case, going hard and going early seems to have involved arranging a forced uh, merger, forced acquisition of Credit Suisse by UBS. Yes, so you might as well panic fast, early, and decisively, yeah. then let it linger. So that brings to the subject of a regulation versus um, intervention. And, well, we see people intervene, right? Uh, we see Swiss, yeah. Swiss National Bank, etc. It's easy to, to criticize, but you seem to be on the side of the regulator and is that the best thing to that uh, they should have done in the US and in Switzerland? Um, well, you always want to be on the same side as the regulator, George. If you're on the other side from the regulator, then you're in trouble. Uh, I'm not necessarily sure that they've made the best decisions in every single case. I do know that they've made defensible decisions, and it's one of the hardest things you ever have to do. Mm -hmm. Even as, as a portfolio manager or as an investor, you're just buying and selling securities. As a CEO, you might have to make some big strategic decisions, but then these guys, they can go for an entire decade without ever having to make any really material decisions. And then in the space of two or three days, in the space of 48 hours, they have to decide whether a massive, globally significant institution that's been around for 168 years has to live or die. It's a, it's, it's a very strange job. And I do think people should be recognizing that before you criticize these people for making much, much more difficult decisions than any of us are ever called on to make. Sure. Yeah. There's the, I think Lenin was saying there's decades when nothing happens and weeks when uh, decades happen. We're certainly decades in happen. one of those weeks. Absolutely. But that does bring the, the question then of, of, uh, regulation, right? And uh, 
again, I'm referring to one of your articles. It seems yeah. to, to me that in the U.S., for example, the banking regulation could be improved, you know, for these type of banks that are mid-sized so, banks. Yes. And therefore, is it that uh, the regulation that we have was not appropriate and we need more regulation or a different set of regulation that will follow this? Well, to an extent, yes, I think. Because, of course, I appreciate that the regulators and the supervisors have to work with partial information very fast. But to a large extent, they create their own information environment. The San Francisco Fed, uh, which was responsible for regulating Silicon Valley Bank, they didn't have to be out of the loop. They didn't have to be making decisions at the very last minute. But it seems like over the last year or so, as they gradually began to realize that Silicon Valley Bank was taking a huge amount of interest rate risk in a very run-prone liability structure, they let the managements try to manage it themselves. They let the managements try to trade out of it. And I think that another bank supervisor, certainly I actually think that a European bank supervisor would have started making much more prescriptive instructions to tell the bank that they were going to have to do things which affected earnings, but which reduced the risk. For Credit Suisse, I think it looks like the SNB has been involved for a while. It looks like that company has been trying to reduce its size and reduce its risk for, for quite some time now. They've jumped in at, the, at a later stage, but... Certainly, I think these they could have let Credit Suisse go on for another six months and then done the same thing. So in many ways, they have taken quite prompt uh, corrective action compared to other things that would have been possible for them to do. And that brings me then to reconnect to the book. Um, and the, the book is about fraud. And you say, for example, later generation of crooks who follow Ponzi's examples in working with assets not covered by financial regulation. So here we're not talking about well, sometimes those uh, stories uh, emerge later, but uh, I don't yeah. think there's anything like that being suggested for right now for Credit Suisse. Yeah. But it seems to me that uh, th then we could extend it to uh, whatever is not regulated enough will foster bad behavior. If that's true, well, we should always do regulate more and regulate more areas. Quite a philosophical it question. Yeah, it's kind of a philosophical question. It's always a trade-off because the more you spend on regulation, the less you're spending on productive activity that makes things that people want. Mm -hmm. I mean, regulation is kind of an interesting product because people need it, but they don't want it, but they have to buy it anyway. And it is a cost on the system. The trouble is, and this is, I think, the deep theme of all the work I've been doing pretty much for my whole career, that the information environment is what creates itself. The big problem of regulation is that it's very hard to know how much regulation something needs until you're mm -hmm. regulating it. You know, so the reason that frauds and fraudsters pick up on things that are outside the regulatory system is that if it's outside the regulatory system, you don't have to tell anyone what you're doing. If you're in a regulated industry, you have to report information. You have to have a degree of transparency. And that makes it a lot easier to see for people to see what you're doing. It's one of the reasons that Bernie Madoff had a whole floor of his office building that nobody except a few dozen trusted employees was allowed to go into. The more you can control the information environment, the more you can grow and you can make sure that no one is able to check up on you. Yes, indeed. And when we see what the cascade of events, uh, perhaps, you know, we can start it. I don't know if they're all connected, but if I look back, I see there's a US Terra, then Free AC, FTX, crypto, that's all crypto, yeah. SVB, yeah. First Republic. Where in there uh, can we say it's fraud? And I would say personally, just to, to you know, not be completely neutral. FTX seems uh, really very much as a fraud, even if it's not been uh, finalized. Yeah. Uh, but what's your view on how much is fraudulent and how much is, uh, well, just this problem of uh, trust and confidence? 
Well, I mean, the interesting thing, actually, and that's a very good point that hadn't occurred to me, is that the contagion here is precisely about people revising their views on what might be fraudulent and what might not. Because the natural condition of everyone in their daily economic life is to not suspect fraud. You, know, you walk down the street in any given week, you might go an entire week without thinking or worrying about whether you were being defrauded. And that was the condition of everyone until three arrows went. Um, and we still don't know whether that was fraud or whether that was just an extremely over-leveraged hedge fund, but it got people thinking. And when people started asking questions about three arrows, they started asking them about FTX and that fell. And then people started thinking, well, if FTX is bad, what else could be bad? And it just starts that cascade because everything that fails, people just start thinking, well, if that's gone, then how can I be sure that this other thing that was nearby and similar to it goes? And so it's just a situation in which people realize that their trust has been misplaced in one entity. And then that makes them revise how much trust they're going to extend to other things in their life. And so that's how the contagion flows. It's because the same people are now deciding that they're going to move from a high trust way of life to a low trust way of life. And that's, that's, that's kind of the vector of contagion that we have to think about. Yes, and also something that I think is worth reminding. You mentioned the Canada paradox, right? Whereas yeah. in high trust society, uh, that's where the fraud happens. Whereas you mentioned Greek, and uh, being half Greek, I'm not <laughs> offended. I understand what you mean. Yeah. I had a conversation about this with Nassim Taleb, and in presentations, I use Lebanon these days rather than Greece. <laughs> Uh, so can you just um, go back to this and you know explain to the audience why yeah. is this happening in kind of the paradox? Yeah, I mean, basically the paradox here is that places like Greece, Lebanon, Nigeria are in many ways low trust societies, but they tend not to have very high degrees of fraud in the economy. And the reason for that is that in a low trust society, you only do business with people you know. So in Lebanon, if you're going to do business with someone, you're going to check them out, check their family out, generations, you know, back to before the birth of Christ. Somewhere like Canada is a high trust society where people generally believe that everyone is going to behave honestly. That's very good for the Canadian economy in a lot of ways, but it does mean that if you show up in Toronto with a nice suit and you remember to say please and thank you, people are not going to check you out. And so after I wrote the book, uh, this case happened where a university in Edmonton had $10 million of building work going on, and it received a single email saying, hiya, these are our new bank details. And on the basis of that, it lost 10 million Canadian dollars just by sending them to the wrong account uh, of a fraudster uh, on the basis of one single email. And yet there's a huge difference between an economy in which that kind of thing happens and then an economy like uh, Greece or Lebanon or Nigeria, where if someone says, these are our new bank details, you would always go out and check because it's, uh, because you expect that kind of thing to happen. Yes. And it seems like for many people, everyone who's been following that has their fraud radar a bit more turned on at the moment? Well, yeah. I wanted to ask one other thing that you mentioned, and it's, it's related to this question of when is it just overhyped? When is it fraud? And there seems to be a substantial difference. But you say there's a qualitative difference between a good company gone bad and an enterprise which has been wholly designed around a fraudulent purpose. So would you say, for example, if we take a specific example, FTX, yeah. Do you think it's a company that has been designed right from the beginning uh, around a fraudulent purpose? It's hard to say from the outside. Mm. I mean, FTX seems to have done things which are firstly specifically illegal in and of themselves. So it told people to send money to a bank account in order to avoid banking controls. When something is trying to consciously avoid 
checks and balances and trying to avoid the transparency and information requirements, that's always a massive red flag. That is, you know, as I say, just simply the act of using one bank account as a cover for another company is illegal in and of itself. And the reason that it's illegal is that there's very few legitimate reasons to do it. There's very few kind of things that it could be doing that would require you to do that. The question of whether FTX is a fraud, it's almost philosophical to me. I think whether or not Sam Bankman fried stole the money or whether or not it was just a very badly run financial institution that raised money and took excessive risks with it, I'd call it in the economic sense a fraud, whether or not it's a criminal fraud, mm -hmm. because it was an organization which, as you say, was set up in such a way to systematically avoid controls that had been put in place to stop things like growing up. So it was, it was based on making people trust something more than they should have trusted it. And now they've lost their money. And I think from an economic sense, that's probably more important than the criminal question of whether it can be proved beyond reasonable doubt that Sam Bankman fried stole the money for himself. Yes, indeed. Okay. So that, that's really an important point, I think in our times and I just brought a quote from Beethot so that we can see that it's not something just new. And um, you made me think about it because you had a conversation on, about yep. Beethot in, um, on Twitter. And he says, uh, the good times of high price almost always endanger much fraud. All people are most credulous when they're most happy and when much money has just been made. When some people are really making it, when most people think they're making it, there is the happy opportunity for ingenious mendacity. It's been I mean, written uh, centuries ago, but it could be it could been written about uh, 20, 2020. You said yes, commercial fraud, uh, criminal fraud. Uh, maybe it doesn't matter, and um, that makes me think as well about the storytelling aspect, which, um, again, in your book you say, the stock market is um, is what may create stores into cash, and yep. what has been happening in the recent era with that. So many stories have been transformed into cash. Sometimes this cash has been materialized in IPOs that later fall at 80%. So is this the right approach to all this, uh, let's call it, uh, you know, overhype and fraud a bit in the same basket and you have to warn against both in the same way? Yes, it is. Although, you know, I would kind of say that's a great quote, by the way, from Budget. Um, but... Of course, the fact that being happy makes you more vulnerable to fraud, now, that's not a reason to not be happy. Mm -hmm. you know, um, fraud does happen in good times. Uh, the way that uh, someone put it to me is that fake gold mines get sold in real gold rushes. Mm -hmm. and the, the statistic that I think amused me and interested me the most uh, when I was writing the whole book is that for most of the 19th century in London, Somewhere between a quarter and a third of all flotations on the lock exchange, on the, lock, the London Stock Exchange, were frauds. Wow. So you can have a huge amount of fraud existing at the same time as a huge amount of legitimate economic activity. And then the other thing, which relates to what you were just saying, is that if a third of them were actual frauds, Probably another third of the companies floated on the London Stock Exchange in the 19th century were companies which were not necessarily conscious frauds, but were in such bad economic condition, they should never have been floated and went bust you know, within a very short period of time. But what I would argue is that if you look back to the 19th century, which was a huge period for stock exchange frauds, and you just look at the frauds, then you really are missing the big picture about uh, the UK in the 19th century. The railways did get built. All these things did happen. Similarly, the dot-com bubble, a huge amount of either frauds or just rickety companies that should never have been floated, but there was a huge amount that did actually get done. 
And this is always the trouble with fraud. It's like the evil twin of the real economy. It's part of the real economy. And you can't necessarily get rid of it. And it might be that the optimal amount of fraud to tolerate, that might be surprisingly high. Mm. Oh, wow. That's, that's a really interesting consideration for investors, right? Which is the point of view that this podcast takes. So indeed, you prefer to live in a high trust environment and in a st stock market where things happen, but uh, possibly a, a high percentage of fraud. I think this high percentage, uh, you know, is definitely something we can apply in crypto, whether something meaningful yeah. is being built is another question. But so how do we as investors look into fraud? And when I say investors, it can be big or, or small, right? Individuals or professionals, because eventually you realize very smart, you know, supposedly professional people fall for the same FTX as the yeah. guy in his room that has put some money in there. Um, and I know that you mentioned some of the, let's say, uh, acid tests in your book, but could you tell us how to approach I, this? I, I think my key test is, this is a rule that was taught to me in the first, I think, three weeks of my career when I went into the Bank of England, because it was an old bank supervisor's proverb, which is that anything that's growing fast needs to be checked out. There's a number of reasons for that. Firstly, frauds tend to grow fast because they have to grow in an accelerating fashion in order to cover up the amount of value that's been extracted by the fraudster. In most cases, the financial accounts of a growing company will be flattered simply by the growth. So anything that's growing really fast needs to be checked out. And then what I ended up adding myself after reading some research on uh, big frauds in the USA, particularly with the Medicare system, is that it needs to be checked out in a way that it hasn't been checked out before. So if you're really thinking about something and thinking, this is growing so fast that it's either a great company or a fraud, try to think laterally, try to think what is the normal checks that people would carry out and I'll do something different because the normal checks are usually the ones that a fraudster will have anticipated and designed the scheme around. So there was one time when I was doing due diligence for some clients of frontline analysts, and there was a business that we weren't sure. It looked great on the numbers. And I ended up telling my consultants that earnings and cash are quite easy to fake. It's very difficult to fake people and buildings. So we did all of our due diligence for this thing on LinkedIn and on Google Earth in order mm. to find out whether whether the buildings were, were where they were and whether the people involved were real people. And uh, well, I probably shouldn't tell you how that one ended up because of client confidentiality, but that was an example of using a different method from the one that someone might have expected to be checked out. The other big rule, which every single short seller I've ever talked to has told me about is people don't change. Hmm. Fraudsters come back to the well. Once someone has committed their first fraud, then something has fundamentally changed in their personality. They've broken through the normal resistance that people have to dishonesty, and they will come back again and again. If you go into a short selling fund, you will find that their biggest piece of intellectual property the thing that they will not share with anyone else and the kind of core value of their fund is their little black book of crooked accountants, crooked stock promoters, crooked PR people, crooked company directors, because whenever you see one of those names, you can generally short it. Uh, a guy once told me, I will short sell jockeys. I don't short sell horses. Um, and regularly you'll have short sellers who will short sell a company without even knowing what the company does because it's got one or two individuals involved with it who are on their little black book. Yeah, sure. Those seems to be very useful rule. But about the fast growth thing, this is something that for if I follow the rule book, we would have to apply, let's say, to all the fintechs um, in, in the area, right? And some were fraud. I mean, there was one, for example, Frank, the one that JP Morgan bought, uh, 
Yeah. There seems to be clearly fraud. Yeah. Some, I guess, are, are debatable. There's been quite a few fraud in there. But when people get so excited about growth, 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 uh, it seems a little bit doing um, to apply this rule. And I think there's, there's a different approach for short sellers who want to identify yeah. the fraud and then can dig deeper mm -hmm. or for, let's say, normal investors who wants to just no. avoid any type of fraud. Um, so is there something simpler or more like with less, um, that requires less inquisition that uh, people can do or anything that smells a bit uh, weird we have to run away from? Well, I mean, one thing, is just simply check out the product. It's not that difficult to apply for a product for uh, most fintechs online. And if you see whether they are capable of setting you up with an account or delivering you a credit card or delivering you a little bit of a kind of peer-to-peer -peer loan that makes payments back to you, then you know that at least this is an actual organization mm -hmm. that is capable of delivering a product. And being a real company that is capable of delivering an actual product is, you know, it's a basic hurdle, but it's one that many people who are fraudulent stock promoters don't always bother to jump over. On the other hand, one thing I would say is don't get too hung up on trying to avoid every single fraud. Uh, one of the things I point out in the book is if you had a rule which made you completely capable of spotting a fake demo, and if you had a investment rule that you would never invest in anyone who faked a demo, then you would have stayed out of Theranos, which would have been fantastic, but you would have stayed out of Oracle, Larry Ellison fake demos. Mm -hmm. You would have stayed out of Microsoft. You know, you, you would have had to have had fantastic performance on your value stocks because an overly sensitive fraud detector would have kept you out of a lot of the greatest growth stories. Unfortunately you do often get people with real companies who hype them a little bit more than they should do. And so you really then, it comes back to your own judgment on the actual product. A lot of what you can do to help yourself is to always think about physical things, people, buildings, and products, um, as well as thinking about numbers, because it's really easy to fake accounts. As I say, it's much more difficult to fake a, a physical object. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to ask about that. Like the, you know, the motto of uh, move fast, break things or fake it till you make it yeah. and etc. So if I try yeah. to rephrase what you're saying, eventually, well, this, this doesn't really matter. I mean, it's, uh, there's going to be some part of fraud uh, we can expect in any market. And uh, maybe it's more about, uh, well, trying to sniff out the, the really bad ones with simple tests and then diversify away the rest. Um, yeah, and diversification helps as well. But uh, yeah, I kind of, I remember I had lots of conversations before the pandemic with people who were very, very emotionally invested in the idea that Tesla was a fraud. You know, mm -hmm. And a lot of people wanted me to start saying publicly that Tesla was a fraud and I just couldn't see it because my my gut feeling was Tesla is clearly an actual company producing a product. You know, you can go down to a showroom and have a test drive in one. You, you know, you can see them on the streets. You know, it's clearly not a fraud in the sense that it is a company that does make Tesla cars. Now, you might disagree with some of their accounting policies or you might think that some of their statements about future product development are hype and you might want to be long or short the company based on that. But if you are asking the immediate question, is this company a fraud? You could clearly tell at that point, no, it wasn't because it was actually producing you know, physical cars from a factory that uh, was selling for cash. Yes. As opposed to Nicola, yeah. who was producing yeah, then Nicola, videos of cars. <laughs> it was it, it, videos of car, videos of trucks rolling downhill. And, and all of that stuff. And it, it's just a completely different situation. Uh, some things are a lot easier to check out than others. Right, right. No, that's, that's very helpful. And a few questions just to finish uh, as we conclude. I, I was wondering how was the reception of the book, the general response, and if you see a uh, pickup maybe when times like today uh, happened. 
Well, it's kind of it's kind of interesting. I mean, after I'd uh, written the book, the publisher pointed me to a quotation by the economist J.K. Galbraith. And J.K. Galbraith wrote a book called The Crash of 1929. And later in his autobiography, he pointed out that that book had never gone out of print since he wrote it, because any time it looked like it was going out of print, there would be another stock market crash and the publisher would decide to put out another edition. And it looks like Lying for Money is beginning to achieve that kind of status. Anytime it looks like it's going to stop selling, there's a massive fraud and people start um, asking me for interviews again. It's, I've had some really interesting discussions since uh, writing that book. I was lucky enough to give a presentation to the SEC on some of the ideas. I don't think there's anything particularly controversial or original in there. A few criminologists gave me a hard time for misusing a lot of their language, and uh, I put an apology in the second edition for that. But it's been, it's been really interesting to think about it, and it's been really interesting to think about the economics of fraud, because as well as all the histories and the stories, there's some really interesting general principles in there which always deal with things that the mainstream subject of economics doesn't necessarily always do deal with very closely for me i think it's something especially now that i understand that fraud is part of what we do it's not just a great book to read because it's a narrative it's also something that frames my mind and now i realize that i can apply it maybe not just about fraud but about well let's call it the hype so one thing that i particularly like in your book and has in common with the book of edward chancellor is that it goes through all the concepts it really gives you a, a framework a, typology of fraud, but it's also a narrative history. How conscious were you about that? Well, it's, I had a lot of help from my editor, actually. I had a really great uh, team of editors at Profile Books. To begin with, I just wrote it as a collection of stories of frauds, some of the more modern ones that I'd had a front row seat from, like LIBOR, and some of the more historical ones that I spent a few afternoons over the course of an entire summer in the British Library, looking up historical documents for frauds. And it was the editorial team at the publisher that encouraged me to say, you've got to have some principles here. You've got to have some structure and theory to it, rather than just having a collection of uh, funny stories about uh, people who committed frauds and then got caught. Yeah, wonderful. No, I think that's such a good job. And now, so moving on to your personal news, I see that you've you've launched your own Substack and have another book coming up. Uh, can you tell us, you know, about this yeah. uh, new approach? Yeah, I mean, this is going on basically from a lot of the things that we've been talking about uh, over the course of this podcast. That it's about information, trust, and organization. And the book that I'm writing, which will be coming out next year in April, so about a year from now is called Decisions Nobody Made, and it's about the way that a modern economy is based on decisions that are made by systems rather than people. So not necessarily systems in the sense of actual computer programs and algorithms, but processes of corporations, policies of government departments. There's more and more going on in the world where there's no individual human being that takes the decision. And on the substack, I'm kind of exploring that from an accounting perspective because some of the most important things that affect people's lives every day are actually the result of decisions someone took earlier when they were putting together an accounting framework. You know, we had a whole crisis in Europe that was really very largely because of accounting conventions. And if you'd gone back 20 or 30 years to the 1980s and 90s when those accounting conventions were being put together and told the people, one day your, the decisions you're making today will cause you know, the insolvency of great European nations, they would probably have suggested that they weren't qualified to make that kind of world-changing decision. Um, and so you have lots and lots of decisions in our modern economy that have been made without anyone realizing quite how serious the thing they were doing was. 
and so that, the subject, the substack is called back of mind because it's all about concepts that I want people to have at the back of their mind when they're looking at numbers or policies to just think, how was this put together? Is the thing that I'm looking at a fact about the physical world or is it the result of a decision that somebody or nobody made five or ten years ago in a committee room? Wonderful. Dan, thank you so much. And we will link to all that in the show notes. And I really encourage people to look at the book as well, because uh, like I said, for me, it's been something that's framed my mind and is uh, useful, not just uh, as a one-off, but uh, on an ongoing basis. I'll leave you with also another quote from Pageot, which is to say, banking is a watchful but not laborious trade. The banker should be constantly be looking out for unseen dangers and the bouts of idiocy that so often envelop the world of finance, which I think is a pretty, <laughs> pretty good that. summary of where we are. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. That's a great quote. So there's nothing new. So wonderful. I'm sure we will also hear and, and see from you in other publications mm -hmm. as, uh, you know, we, we're about yeah. to uh, talk a lot more about banking. I hope you don't hear too much from, from me for the next few years. People only hear from me when things are going bad. I'll, I, I'll try and keep quiet until the book launch. I'll monitor your appearance as a bearish signal. I think so. Great. Thanks very much, George. It's been great. Thank you for listening to Investorama, your guide to the future of investing without the hype.